Um, thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate the invitation. And like Sharon said, my name is Delia Scott. Um, I am the really actually very new Extension Associate for Floriculture, Greenhouse, and um, Controlled Environment Horticulture, or CEH. Um, I've been in this position for about a month now, and I am still trying to figure out all of the, the nuances with, with the greenhouse and the floriculture industry. Um, my background is in horticulture and agriculture, and I most recently was in the entomology department at UK. Um, that was more of a more of a field position um, research analyst. We looked at a lot of different like insect exclusion methods, um, actually worked some with poultry, which was very interesting. Um, but I'm very glad to be back in the world of plants. Um, there's a lot that has happened in the greenhouse industry since I've, I've been um, away from horticulture for a little bit. And so I'm still getting reacquainted with it and I'm really excited about it. So um, that being said, before we get started, I do want to throw out a, an enormous thank you to Dr. Garrett Owen. This is essentially his PowerPoint. Um, I've, I've whittled it down a little bit and kind of made it more of my own, but it, it is definitely from him. Most of the pictures are from him and the content. Um, and for those of you that don't know Dr. Owen, he is also a fairly recent hire. He started, um, I guess, over a year ago, like right as COVID was hitting. So some of you may not have gotten an opportunity to work with him yet, but he's, he's fantastic. He's the assistant extension professor for floriculture, greenhouse, and controlled environment. So... That being said, we will jump right into this. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about energy efficiency and bedding plant production. And while this PowerPoint is geared more towards commercial producers, a lot of it can be scaled um, for smaller producers and even homeowners. There's just some tips and techniques in here, just some things to think about if you just have a hobby greenhouse or if you do um, grow things on a larger scale. So just to get started, this is kind of the, a classic look at what a, a greenhouse in Kentucky might look like, a, a giant production greenhouse, um, maximizing the floor space and the bench space. There are walkways in between here, and then they're also making use of um, the rafters up here to hang, hanging baskets, so they're, they're really maximizing their space. Um, I do want to point out there's a lot of overlap between high tunnels and greenhouses, and high tunnels are typically unheated. Greenhouses are heated, and they're more of like a four-season thing, whereas high tunnels are maybe three-season, maybe not in the dead of winter. So what I'm talking about today is mostly greenhouse, but we will touch on some high tunnel stuff as well. So some things that you really have to think about in terms of operating a greenhouse, the biggest, the biggest operating cost is your energy. Um, this usually accounts for about 10 to 30 percent where we are, the mid to northern latitudes, which is basically about half of North America. And this does um, eat up a, a big chunk of your budget if you do have a greenhouse. Um, natural gas used to be one of the things that was used to heat greenhouses, but that has started to decline and level off in recent years. People also use propane, but that has seen a pretty substantial decrease, about 54% in maybe the last 10 years or so. But electricity is what people are really using nowadays, and they've seen about a 5% increase in this. Um, this is most likely due to just availability of it. Um, it's pretty consistent. Propane, you have to deal with refilling tanks. Um, it probably is a little bit more common in rural areas, but electricity is um, pretty straightforward pretty reliable. With that being said, I did actually just visit um, a grower in Hopkinsville, actually, in, in Kelly Jackson's neck of the woods a few weeks ago, and he was talking about he had a power outage earlier this winter, and he essentially lost an entire greenhouse full of cucumbers. So even if you do use electricity, um, backup generator is always a good idea. So some of the strategies for reducing your heating and electrical energy costs, um, these are pretty straightforward, also pretty basic. Lowering your air temperature set point is a good place to start. Starting your production later in the season to try to avoid some of the cooler temps. Um, consolidating your production areas, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Installing plastic or thermal energy curtains and insulation. Purchasing energy efficient heaters. 
um, root zone heating. This is an interesting thing. And then there are some alternative fuels and horticultural light sources available as well. So we've got a bunch of photos um, in the coming slides that just kind of demonstrate the use of some of these techniques. They're pretty low cost, um, easy on the budget. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Remay, the spun bond polyethylene fabric. Um, there are different weights of that available. So some of them are used more for like frost protection as opposed to just like insect protection. So this is a grower, um, I think this is in Michigan actually, that's just using a heavier weight of this blanket to cover up um, some stock, some nursery stock in pots here. And they have it tucked nicely under the pots. And I think that is clamped together. It's got a clip on it or something. So this is a heavier weight for cooler climates. And then this next photo, um, this weight is a little bit lighter. You can actually see the plants and see the tags through there. So there are different weights of, of fabric cloth you can buy. This is just another photo, um, a little bit larger scale using, using the same technique, just basically covering up these plants, um, just sealing them in in preparation for a cold snap. This can also be used for like a nursery pad. So if you have plants outside, same technique. These actually look like taxis, I think, which are um, pretty hardy, but if they are tender, if they have new growth on them, then a frost blanket is also appropriate to use here. Um, this is just a photo outside of a greenhouse, so maybe as a hardening off area. Um, I think that's actually from the, the previous photo, um, but just, just showing that you can uncover and recover as needed if you get a cold spill. This is something I think is pretty interesting, um, just basically making like a drop ceiling for your greenhouse. So making sure that the heat, the air, the warm air stays about the level of your plants. Um, basically here all they've done is, is just create a, a plastic sheeting across the level of the greenhouse. And this just helps to create a little bit of a microclimate and keep things a little bit warmer. Same technique here, um, this producer has basically stretched a wire across the length of the greenhouse and put a piece of plastic over it just in preparation. If it does get cold, all he has to do is basically pull it from one side of the greenhouse to the other, um, thus creating that little microclimate, lowering the ceiling and reducing the, the area that he has to heat. Um, again, the same thing here. Since they do have hanging baskets in this greenhouse, it's basically just pulling the plastic over on top of those. Same principle, just lowering the ceiling and creating more of a, a sealed environment. Um, here they have just an area that they're not using that's kind of sealed off. I think those are, or those points that is that they're going over there. Um, kind of the same principle with your house. If there are unused rooms that you don't that you don't use frequently or you don't heat or cool, keep the door closed. That way your furnace doesn't have to work quite as hard. Same thing applies in the greenhouse. So we'll talk a little bit about um, plant responses to temperature. So the base or the minimum temperature is the temperature above which development proceeds. So to say this another way, it's the temperature at which no development will occur um, the optimal temperature is where plant development is at its maximal, and then the maximum temperature is a temperature above which development ceases. So the plants aren't necessarily dying, but they're not growing. They're just kind of sitting there. I think we've probably all experienced that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is just a little graph just showing um, your base temperature here is probably about 42 degrees, and then your optimum temperature is about 72. Maximum temperature in this case is about 92. This is just showing the tolerable range. This is the range where most of your plant development is going to happen. Um, this is what basically influences the production time. If you're a commercial grower, if you're, if you're producing plants for market, um, not only does it influence production time, but it also influences quality. Um, and in this upper corner, talking about that average daily temperature, this is determined as a 24 hour average. Um, growers take note of this because again, this is how you control plant development to get it to where it's most marketable for you. And this is of course also um, species dependent, of course. And 
So we're going to look at a couple of different plants here. We have snapdragons and we also have um, pintas. So snapdragons have a lower base temperature, which is about 36 degrees. Um, yes, and then pintas have a higher base temperature. It's about 49 degrees. So snapdragons will obviously grow better at lower temperatures than pintas. And that being said, the optimum temperature for snapdragon is going to be different than pintas, as is the maximum temperature is going to be different than it is for pintas. Um, maximum temperature for snapdragons is about 87 and pintas is about 96. Um, and these are like the constant temperatures that the plants grow best at. So if a snapdragon is exposed to a temperature that's higher than 87 um, during its development stage, it's not going to kill it. But again, it's just not going to really do much. Um, short term exposure is, is not a big deal, but you don't want to have it at that temperature for a long time. Um, so we'll also talk a little bit about base temperature. So there are basically kind of three types of bedding plants. We're talking about annuals here. Um, cold tolerant plants can tolerate about 39 degrees, um, sometimes lower. Cold temperate plants can go between 40 and 45 degrees as their base temperature. And then cold sensitive plants go to 46 degrees or higher. And I'll give some examples of those as well. Um, cold tolerant plants include things like azuratum, um, petunias, rudbeckias, snapdragons, osteospermum, um, cold temperate plants that grow like as their base temperature between 40 and 45 include coreopsis, geraniums, salvia, verbena, and then, excuse me, we have cold sensitive plants that are about 46 degrees, and those include things like angelonia, um, begonias, ornamental peppers, vinca, and also zinnias. So to look at a couple of examples here, um, this is a study that was done at Michigan State. And so this is the air temperature, the constant temperature at the top here. And then at the bottom, the numbers we have are days from transplant of plugs to the first open flower. So at a constant temperature of 55 degrees, um, or sorry, 54 degrees, it actually took 55 days for Petunia to, to bloom, as opposed to a constant temp of 75, it only took 28 days for them to bloom. Um, what else is I going to say? Oh, the average, the DLI, for those of you that don't know this, and I'm actually learning this as well, this is the daily light integral. So it's basically the amount of photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, PAR. Um, this is kind of like a rain gauge is an easy way to think about it. So a rain gauge collects like the total rain at a certain location over a certain period of time. And DLI measures the total amount of PAR, P-A-R, um, kind of the same way. So it measures the amount received in a day. And greenhouse growers can measure this with the use of a light meter. Um, and they can basically measure the number of light photons that accumulate in a square meter over a 24-hour period. And this also has to do with your plant development. So we'll look at a few more examples of different species here. Um, Geraniums are, are another one we can look at with a constant temperature between 63 and 79. Um, at a constant temp of 63, it took 70 days to bloom, whereas it only took 41 days for the constant temp at 79. So that's almost, what, half the amount of time with, with just a, not really that much of an um, increase in temperature. Um, another one to look at is angelonia. This is one of the cold sensitive ones. So cold sensitive is at 46 or lower. Um, so basically any temperature below 50 here, the plants were just dead. They did absolutely nothing, obviously did not flower. Once we got above about 59 or 60 degrees, start to see some growth going up to 68. You're starting to see more. 77 is, is the biggest yet. But then this is interesting. Once you hit a constant temp of 86, um, it actually took a little bit longer to bloom and the plants don't look quite as vigorous as the other two. So that is, is maybe approaching like the maximum temperature for this species. 
Um, so temperature obviously also has an effect on flowers. Um, I think we have looks like impatience here and then also straw flowers. So with cooler temperatures, you can get a little bit more in terms of um, flower size and also color. And then as the temperature goes up, flower size is going to decrease. Color changes for straw flower. And this is something um, a lot of flowers are more attractive at cooler temperatures. I think this is delphinium. Um, we've got a forcing temperature down at the bottom here. Again, once we hit um, 79 degrees, which is on the high end for this species, you have a shorter plant, more compact plant, maybe not quite as many flowers, um, definitely um, a different color and flower, smaller flower size. So this is also something that growers have to think about in terms of marketability um, and, and yet another reason to keep your air temp lower. So we'll switch gears just a little bit and talk um, about freezing injury and symptoms. Um, this is usually when it gets below 32 degrees for sensitive plants and some symptoms that you usually see browning, blackening, curling of the shoots, the buds, the flowers. But a lot of times we won't see these symptoms until the plants are brought back up to warmer temperatures. I think this is something that probably happens to me every spring in Kentucky because of our fantastic, unpredictable weather. Um, you put something out a little bit too early and you get a cold night, you get a frost, you get a freeze. And if it doesn't kill it, it definitely stunts it. I think we're probably all guilty of planting tomatoes a little bit too early. The old adage, what is it, that it's safe to plant on Derby Day? That's not always true. I think our last frost date in central Kentucky is about May 15th, and, and, and that's true. Um, it's not always safe to, to plant just because of kind of like a, um, yeah, just May 5th is not a good time to plant tomatoes. We'll just say that. Um, young tissue on plants is obviously more vulnerable, and this is why we harden off plants. Um, I think we all kind of know what that means to just acclimate the plant to, to colder temperatures. Um, a lot of people do this with, with seedlings. So if you start seedlings inside and you um, aren't quite ready to, to transplant, but you do want to harden them off, you stick them outside for a nice afternoon, but then bring them back in at night. Um, and as plants acclimate, they, they do get more tolerant to cold. So just a photo of coleus here, which is a more of like a warm season annual. This is, these are two different cultivars at a 70 degree constant air temperature, looking exactly like coleus should look. And then this is what happens to them at 10 hours of 34 degree air temperature. Um, these are pretty much toast. This, it's questionable that they can rebound from something like this. Um, yeah, I actually had some really nice coleus this year that I brought home a little bit too early, and most of them did end up looking like that. So switching gears um, just a little bit, going to chilling injury and symptoms. Um, this is cold damage that occurs to plant tissues of sensitive species, even when temperatures are above 32 degrees. So basil is a kind of classic example. It's super sensitive to colder temperatures. Um, this is what the damage looks like. Browning of the new growth, um, distortion, um, some dead leaves. Over here, we also have some poinsettias, which, which are a sensitive species. Um, and this includes like leaf cupping and curling. Okay. Um, chilling and freezing injury can actually also happen in the greenhouse. So even if you do have a heated greenhouse, this can occur. Again, you see the basil on the left-hand side with, with symptoms of chilling injury. And then you have geraniums that are located right in front of the intake fan in the greenhouse. So it makes sense if it's cold outside and you open up the fan and, and you're blasting in cold air. If you have plants right in front of the fan, you're, you're definitely going to see some injury. Um, here's just some more examples of what cold injury can look like. I think this is maybe sweet potato vine. Um, you get some bleaching of the leaves, um, margin burn here. Um, this maybe looks like pintas, and you've got some flower bud death here, and some more spotting on the leaves. And I'm thinking this is telangia, the air plant, and these are just um, these are just dead. They do not do well with cold temperatures. 
So how do you prevent chilling and freezing injury in a greenhouse? It seems like that would be a pretty safe place since it is heated. Um, but if you have some plants that are situated right by your door, the door swings open, cold air rushes in, and your plants are essentially toast. But you can put up some kind of barrier. This is relatively inexpensive, just a piece of plastic that you can put at the, at the entrance to the door um, just to block that cold rush of air from coming in. So we will talk a little bit about heat stress, which is something that can also occur in a greenhouse. Um, this happens when plants are suspended at the top of a greenhouse on warm days. So if you have hanging baskets in your upper tier here, even if it's nice and cool at the bottom level, at, at your floor level and at your bench space, it can be about 40, 45 degrees hotter up there. This is definitely something to think about, especially when we do get nice days in like late winter and early spring. Um, this can kill plants pretty quickly at temperatures like this. And then just the illustration over to the right, again, it may be 52 degrees air temperature, but up by the heaters, it is about 280 degrees, and that will fry your stuff in a heartbeat. So moral to that story, do not place plants in front of the heaters. Um, heat injury is also something that, that can occur with excessively high temperatures. This is obviously species dependent. So like cold species, alpine species are going to exhibit heat injury at lower temperatures than like tropical species. Um, symptoms can vary with this. It depends on the magnitude and their duration of the exposure. Um, just, just a couple of photos of what heat stress can look like in the greenhouse. I think these are ivy geraniums. Um, this was actually short-term exposure I think Garrett, Dr. Owen took this photo um, and these were grown in the top of the greenhouse. The grower eventually put shade cloth at the top of the, of the greenhouse to help with this. Um, but you can just see like the bleaching of the leaves and um, flower bud death and um, lots of dead leaves. But that can be avoided with um, shade cloth. So just looking a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, root zone heating which is pretty interesting. I think we've maybe people that have started seedlings before, you can use like the heat mats, kind of the same principle here. This is a good way to reduce heating costs. So there is a study that had um, the air temperature at a consistent 60 degrees Fahrenheit and then tried, tried different root zone temperatures just to see the effect that, that it would have on the time to flower. There was also a control treatment so the air temperature for the control is a steady 68 degrees, and then the root zone temp was 65. So three weeks after a transplant, you can see the two controls. Um, it took about 42 days for these to flower at the control treatment. And then looking on down to the, to the different treatments here with the different root zone temperatures, um, 52 days to flower for the ones that had a root zone temp of 60 and then up to 80 degrees, it took 51 days to flower. So there's really not that much of a difference there, but you do notice um, a difference in plant quality. Um, marketability is something that, that obviously commercial growers look at a lot. So that's based on like how well the plant fills out the pot. Um, if it covers all of the media, you know, like when you buy the, a plant in a garden center, you look and, and you try to get like the nicest looking plant that has a full uniform shape. Um, so this is something that, that growers are looking towards. And this is why this kind of research is really um, informative, just to, to kind of show you what can look like what with different temperatures and, and different days. So they also looked at verbena, which is a cold intermediate species. And that is one of the ones that can go um, 42, 46 degrees as their base temperature. Again, they had the control at a 68 degree air, 65 degree root zone. And then for the treatment, they had 60 degree air temperature as a constant and then different root zone temperatures ranging from 60 to 80. Um, and you can again see the time to flower, the days at the bottom. Again, the control did the best and took about 29 days for these to, to flower. And then compared to 80 degrees for the root zone, it took 36 days to flower, and then it took 40 days to flower um, at the 60 degree root zone temperature. And again, you have to think this is species dependent. 
on um, what temperature is, is best for the species. Um, looking at Vinca, this is a pretty interesting one. Um, the ones that were at 60 degrees, because this is a cold sensitive species, um, they never flowered. So 60 degree root zone temp for Vinca is obviously too cold. Um, 80 is just about right. Took about 49 days to flower at the, at the 80 degree root zone temp. And then one more, um, New Guinea impatience, also a cold sensitive species. This one is also um, pretty interesting. The control with the air temp of 68 and the root zone temp of 65, it took 71 days to flower, which is a lot. Um, that's what, two months and 11 days approximately. But then with even with all of these other temperatures, um, they never flowered. So the asterisk at the bottom is just saying they never, within this, this period of time, they never, they never even flowered. So obviously 60 degree air temperature did not work here. Um, 68 degree air temp did work, um, but it should probably be even warmer than that just for this species. But 71 days is a long time to wait for a New Guinea patient to flower. Okay, so I did talk a little bit about unheated high tunnels um, at the very beginning, just the difference between that and a greenhouse. So just to kind of reiterate, high tunnels have um, single or multi-span poly house or a hoop house. Um, they are taller. They do have a more uniform temperature than a cold frame, which is usually a little bit more like a low tunnel. Um, I do know that there are lots of folks that have applied for like the NRCS, the QIP grant program, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and gotten high tunnels. Um, the stipulation with that grant, and I'm getting off topic here, I'm sorry, but this is, it's, it's kind of related. Um, to get one of these tunnels, you do have to grow in the ground. I think it's for like a three-year period, and then after you age out of that period, um, you can kind of do what you want with it. Um, so what we're seeing people do is they're growing in the ground until they start to have issues with the soil or until they get out of that grace period. And then they'll switch over to container production for these. And so that is when it becomes more of like our area, the floriculture, greenhouse, um, control environment, horticulture, kind of sort of. So if you're growing in a container, definitely reach out to me and to Dr. Owen. If you're growing in the ground in a high tunnel, that is Dr. Rachel Rudolph's area of expertise. Um, but we do have some overlap between those two. Um, we are also seeing a lot of producers use these as more of like a, like a hardening off area, um, a little bit more of like a season extension, um, also like as a place to sell out of, so as, as more of a retail center. So here's just a few examples of how people are using high tunnels. And uh, this is probably more to like harden off plants, the scrower has um, probably pallets on cinder blocks and then his, his bedding plants on top, again maximizing the space with using hanging baskets. Um, another example of this one is probably landscape fabric, maybe on top of gravel um, and then just flat right on top of that. This is a good use of space also. And this is more of a cold frame, so it's a little bit shorter. And these are just typically used to, to harden off transplants that are a little bit lower. Um, the scrubber still has the plastic on here to pull over in case of cold temps. Um, kind of a classic scene that you will see at some garden centers and nurseries, a high tunnel with the, the plastic pulled off for this season. Um, advantages and disadvantages to this, obviously you get um, for irrigation, but then sometimes you get too much for irrigation, so that can be problematic. Um, just another example of this, this grower again has his flats, his containers on pallets. This can help with um, sanitation issues, so disease, fungal issues, um, just keeps things a little bit cleaner also, might also help with drainage. Um, just another example, this is a cold frame again, hardening off some trays some flats of bedding plants. And people do tomatoes a lot in these, hardening them off. And this is just a shot of an extension of the nursery pad. So again, hardening off bedding plants here, those are most likely what pansies, violas over through there. 
So they probably came out of that high tunnel slash greenhouse and just straight out here to harden off, which is a great idea if you have this space. But then again, um, you can't experience things like this, especially in Kentucky in late spring. It is not unheard of to have an inch or two of snow. I think that actually happened in April of this year. I have a picture somewhere. Okay, so we'll get back into a little bit of the research. Um, this is doing a comparison of growing um, in a high tunnel, in high tunnel and outdoors, and then just outdoors. This is actually really interesting. It was published in Port Technology in 2016. Um, let me see what the title of it was. High tunnel and outdoor production of containerized annual bedding plants in the Midwestern US um, by Olberg and also Lopez. If you're interested in this, I just thought it was cool. It talks about the, the TTM is the time to marketability. So this is in days. Um, it also talks about the growth index and the stem. Um, they measured the stem length and then the branch number. And this is um, the dry weight. But you can just see the difference here. So the time to to marketability for the ones that were grown in the high tunnel and an unheated high tunnel just with minimum protection, took 28 days, um, whereas in the high tunnel and outdoors, it took 32 days, and then just outdoors took 34 days. But just look at the difference in the quality here. Um, just the, the Calabracchia that's covering all of the pot, all of the media, versus these other two that just don't really look that great. And we have a few more examples of these, um, Lobelia, same thing, grown in the unheated high tunnel, took 25 days to marketability versus outdoors, it took 31 days, still doesn't look that great. And then outdoors took 34 days, still is not that great. Um, the stem, stem length is pretty much the same throughout all of them. Branch number is, is a little bit different, but you can just really see in terms of quality and then also flower count on there. And then again, looking at geraniums, royal lavender, in a high tunnel, it took 35 days to bloom to marketability. High tunnel on outdoors, it took 49. And then outdoors strictly, it took 56. And again, the ones that are associated with this being outdoors do not look that great. So what they basically came up with was um, there were developmental delays with all the species that they trialed. Minor delays included um, Primula, Osteospermum, Calabrachia, and Verbena, ranging from like a four-day delay to seven days. Intermediate, Lobelia, Phlox, and Petunia range from nine days to 11 days development. And then a major delay was the Regal Geranium, um, and that took 26 days extra. So some of the risks of outdoor production, obviously, death due to low temperatures, um, cold damage, weed pressure, flowering delay. Um, you also have um, increase for disease, increased insect damage, all kinds of things if you're just looking at strict outdoor production. And so a little bit of a summary here. Um, plant development is temperature dependent. So if you are growing outdoors, you should expect flowering delay under reduced air temperatures. Um, but bedding plants can be grown. Um, under low to no energy requirements, kind of a combination of the two, depending on where you are, depending on species. And we are looking at um, some smaller in-house trials, especially for Kentucky. We have a pretty unique climate here. We have some pretty um, extreme temperatures, but we also have to think in terms of like climate change, things are going to vary from year to year. So strictly outdoor production might be kind of hard, but a combination of greenhouse and or high tunnel seems like it's the way to go. So contact information. Um, again, I am new in this position. Um, I am open and I welcome any thoughts or comments on stuff that people might need. Agents, um, master gardeners, homeowners, anyone else who's on this talk, please, please reach out to me if I can help in any way. Um, we're trying to do like a needs assessment for what the industry in Kentucky um, is looking for just so we can kind of direct our efforts most effectively and efficiently. And then again, Dr. Garrett Owen is the assistant extension specialist for floriculture. His contact information is here. We are both on the horticulture website. Um, so please do reach out any questions, any comments.
And with that, if I can answer any questions, I will try my best to do so.